So, uh, we're going to talk about hacking web servers. This is certainly what I thought of as the original hacking when I was not in the game yet. That's when you go into a browser, type a few commands to take over the web server, and it used to be that easy. Uh, back in the days of Windows NT web servers, you could just go into the URL bar of the browser and navigate through the file system to find CMD and run it and have a command prompt right there in the browser. It was ridiculous. Now, in the modern world, um, it's not so much web servers serving up static content that people use. Um, they use more sophisticated web applications because if people aren't content to just open web pages and see static things anymore. They want to log in and comment and shop and all that jazz. So now you have servers running on the web and people sending up data which is then used to store stuff on the web. And so that's, those are web applications and they're a really big aspect of the modern internet and security. And they tend to have a whole series of reproducible vulnerabilities as they each make the same mistakes over and over and over. And that's the point here. So now you have your clients down here running some kind of laptop or cell phone or something with a web browser, and they send requests up to the server, and the server hands up pages. Now, the original web server by itself is really not much more than a file server, like FTP. You have a file, you can serve up a file. HTTP just lets you view files too, uh, HTML files and image files and movie files and so on. Now, you can fetch them over HTTP, which means you send unencrypted packets over IP, which bounce off routers and go to any destination that appears to have the correct IP address, resolving it by an insecure protocol, DNS over UDP. Nothing is signed and nothing is verified. So if you use HTTP and fetch a web page, you have no idea who you're really talking to. You get some page that looks like Yahoo, and your browser says yahoo.com in the bar, that doesn't really mean at all that you've really made it to Yahoo. You have no real evidence for that. It just means anybody who knows about half of what you learn in this class has decided to fool you into thinking you've gone to Yahoo. Um, but HTTPS means you have a very high degree of certainty that you're really talking to the right company because a trusted third party has verified that you know who you're talking to and everything's encrypted so nobody can read it except the intended recipient. And that system works very well. It's not perfect, but it's a whole lot more secure than HTTP. So uh, there are two popular web servers that run almost every website. <coughs> Apache is the free open source one. Again, it's used by almost all small companies. And IIS is Microsoft, and that's used by almost all big corporations. And there's a very simple reason. If you take the Microsoft classes and learn server administration, there are, um, if you are a big corporation like a Yahoo or AOL or Microsoft or something, then you have to face really complicated problems. Like suppose I am Yahoo and I buy Netflix and I have to connect Netflix to my whole company and have their administrators have privileges and the network and everything. The open source community is not there for you. There is no facility in a Unix server to make that transition easy, but there totally is in the Microsoft world. They have domains and forest and cross forest trusts and transitive trusts and all sorts of complicated server features that make it possible for you to do something like that. Merge with another company and integrate their giant domain of worldwide computers into your giant domain of worldwide computers and make it work. So the big companies are forced to use Microsoft domain controllers because they're the only people playing in that space anymore where they have the features you really need to run a big company. And once you start using Microsoft domain controllers, it is very, very much easier to use Microsoft everything to go with it. So you use Microsoft web servers, I asked to go with it. And so the big companies are doing that, and the small companies that don't need those fancy features are typically using things like Linux and Apache. Yeah? Do you know what happened in uh, June 2011, or whatever, Um, I, I don't know exactly. I know Microsoft released a new server version at that time, but there, I do know um, until about Heartbleed, I think it was 2010. Uh, no, it was more like 2012 or 13. See, people believed that Linux was more secure until about Heartbleed. It was 2013 or 2014, I think. And there have been two or three successive massive security disasters of Linux, which have totally erased the belief that Linux is more secure than Windows and proven it is absolutely not true. First, Android was the first proof. Google proved that if you make open source software crappy enough, it's as bad as Windows. Um, and then uh, huge disasters in the, SS, in the security of Linux occurred. So, you know, I think one big advantage was security, but even so, people put up with Microsoft's insecurity because they really need those enterprise class features and they're willing to put up with almost any sacrifice to get them. Anyway. Um, 
So there are other ones, by the way. Nginx is a stripped-down version of Apache, which I understand was originally written by Russian criminals to control botnets. It is much, much faster than Apache, and for a long time, the only documentation was in Russian, and it's been coming up now, Nginx more and more. It's much faster than Apache. It's much less bloated. Um, and there's a few other ones out there used for special purposes, but most web pages are being served by IIS or Apache. So that's the actual server that serves up the main files, but the web application is written in another language and added on here. And as we've talked about before, every code base has bugs. Uh, nobody is able, has any way that's known to really find all the mistakes in programs and fix it, so you just use it anyway. Um, and every program, you only fix the bugs that matter and you just put up with the ones that don't matter. And every time you update it, you erase some of the old bugs and you replace them with fresh bugs. So um, the problem with web applications is you might have millions of people all using the same web application. So they're more likely to find a bug, and when you find a bug, it's going to affect more people. So in the old days, you'd have static web pages just sitting there with HTML. Um, they don't do much. And now for run dynamic web pages, you add more components like form tags, which can collect data from the user and then pass it on to a script on the server. And the scripts are CGI scripts, and they can be written in a variety of languages, um, Cold Fusion, PHP, and all these different uh, scripting languages are available. Server-side JavaScript is now quite popular with the new platforms like Node.js. Um, so web forms have a form element. This is just an HTML feature that can collect data from the user and then process it, to up, send it up to the server, and then some real programming language, not HTML, must be used to process it. So here's a form where you can type in a name and a password. There's not even a submit button in this one, so it doesn't do anything. But I think it's an example from your book. That's, what, of course, what you've seen. Login forms look like this and shopping forms and such. So when you're done filling in the form, you press submit. And then you might have JavaScript running in your browser, which will process the input locally. And then it passes it up to the web server with the same old HTTP or HTTPS. If you don't use HTTPS, then it's not encrypted, unless you've added some other encryption of your own, which is almost always a very bad idea. It is much safer to use the standard encryption in HTTPS that people have labored so much to perfect. And then it goes up to the web server, and the scripts can run on the web server or on other servers up there to process that data. <coughs> uh, CGI is the common gateway interface that moves data from a server to a browser, and these uh, are written in scripting languages. In the old days, they tended to be written in Perl. Uh, nowadays, it's more likely something like PHP or ASP. But there are many, many languages, and in principle, it could be any programming language processing your data on the server. I know um, one of the big HTTPS security disasters came a few years ago when uh, Dan Kaminsky and I think Moxie Marlin Spike independently learned that the uh, software handing out digital certificates was written in Pascal. And it had an entertaining security bug we'll talk about having to do with the way Prandtl processed strings that made it possible to buy a wildcard certificate that would sign any domain. But anyway, um, so for example, you can have a Perl comment. Perl is quite easy to read. You can just print things out in it. And I think I've got, uh, yeah. So I used to have a feedback form on my page many years ago back before there was uh, Rate My Professor, which is probably a better place to put feedback. And when I did, I wrote a simple feedback form in script in Perl. So here's what I had those years ago. Um, there was a forum here where you could say what class you're taking and whatever you want to say about it. And then I said, it's up for a couple of years. And then some Italian Viagra sites started spamming it with thousands of links to Italian porn sites. So I um, put in a CAPTCHA, which consists of a horse that's always a horse. It doesn't vary at all. But it was enough to stop the automated attacks. And then um, the script that processed that looked like this. I wrote it in Perl. So in comes a request. And the request has these. You can harvest it with Perl with this thing called Param. So three things come up, class, comments, and animal. Those are the three things that people send up. So to remove spam, if the animal is not horse, then say your comment appears to be spam and reject it. If the animal is horse, then it takes, um, opens the results file which also was a hidden parameter coming from my server, which is actually a pretty bad idea. But you don't see it on the page, but I had the results file as a hidden parameter here, which is a common but unwise way to write a page. Um, you have options, and somewhere is results file. 
I, I'm not, anyway, I may, may, that may not be the form that exactly goes to this, but anyway, in came this results file. So if you take the web application security class, you find out you can totally hack these, you could catch that and burp and change the file so you could make the feedback go to a different file. And this is one of the many kinds of vulnerabilities, the most common type you see in PHP, where people can deface web pages. Because they take the script that's supposed to put their comments on the comments page and redirect it to put like a you know, anonymous mask on the home page or something. If you're able to control the file where it goes. Anyway, that's all it does. Um, and it didn't filter it at all. So you could put HTML tags in and people started putting scripts that popped up and stuff. And I learned about cross-site scripting by being vulnerable and getting hacked. I, a student did it in class, and so I gave him extra credit and began learning how to write better scripts. But that's an example of the old-fashioned way to do it, and a lot of web pages are still made with no more sophistication than that, although they're usually written in other languages. ASP is Microsoft server-side script engine. It runs on IIS, and it's similar. You write things in there. That's, in fact, the, uh, the language I used to write a scripts years ago that shared uh, practice certification exams with students. And uh, that's the one that Anonymous tried to hack uh, when they were mad at me. And one of their members contacted me to warn me, so I turned it off. Anyway, um, so ASP, just another language. You can put ASP commands inside an HTML file with this less than percent tag. This is one of the crazy things about HTML. HTML itself is not a programming language, but you need some programming features. So there are tags which add other languages inside the HTML file, which violates no end of good practices. You really ought to have one language per file at the very least. And those tags are ignored by the browser if they don't understand that language. It'll just interpret it as a comment. And this is another crazy thing about HTML. Uh, languages like C, if you put in an invalid command, will just stop and say invalid command. HTML is intended to be used by a wide variety of servers and clients at different versions. So if HTML encounters a tag that it does not understand, like less than percent, it says, well, I guess I must be an old version, and that must be some future command that I don't support, so I'll just ignore it. Because it's like television. You don't want your television to just pop up a page and say there's error in the source code of this program, you can't see it. You want it to do its best to let you see the program, even if you don't see all the features. And that's what HTML does, which means it's intrinsically confusing and less secure. But anyway, ASP uses the less than percent. So Apache is relatively stable and reliable, very popular. Um, we used to have some classes here in configuring Apache before Peter Wood retired, and they were really very popular. Um, they had very common to find them. And you can run it on Windows, although I don't know anybody doing that. It mainly pe most people using Apache are running it on Linux. Um, now, you're, you can write your scripting languages, like I say, in any language you want, but common ones are PHP and JavaScript. Microsoft shops used to use VBScript. I think Microsoft is deprecating it. I don't even think it's supported in the latest browser, Edge. Um, so PHP originally stood for personal home page, and the point was to make it easy to automate web pages. And it's considered a language used by sort of cowboys to make fast features. Uh, it is notorious for being insecure. And that reputation is very well deserved. Almost any page designed with PHP will get hacked sooner or later. It is very difficult to write PHP without making a mistake that lets people hack your server. That's one of the many reasons why WordPress sites get hacked all the bloody time. Um, but it's very easy to write the code. And I'm using it extensively because I don't care if people hack me. That's good for me. But um, anyway, again, you use this less than question mark PHP to start tags and a question mark greater than at the end of it, so it creates something which will be interpreted by the HTML parser as an invalid HTML tag and ignored, but if you have a PHP processor, it will pick the PHP out of the page and process it. So um, here's PHP, you can hit the echo hello world, this will just print hello world on the screen. You see you start with HTML with a title, and then in the middle of it, you just put in PHP tags. Um, so the two processors will make two passes through this file and understand it. Um, it has a lot of known vulnerabilities. It's often used with, with MySQL databases. There's two general types of, of web server sites. One is LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. And the other is Microsoft, where you have the Microsoft version of everything. Microsoft SQL Server and ASP and IIS. Most sites are one or the other. ColdFusion is an expensive uh, third-party solution um, that you have to buy from these guys, which I think are now Adobe. I've never used it because it costs too much, but some people love it. Um, the sites that pay money for this stuff get things like Dreamweaver and uh, it used to be Fireworks. I think there's now new versions of these things in Cold Fusion. There's uh, expensive products you work together on commercial sites. 
Uh, cold fusion has this thing called CF, so it's less than CF location and a greater than sign to end it. They all have these uh, different ways of taking something that will make it look like an HTML statement to your HTML browser, but have some invalid beginning so it will know to just ignore it. And it has, like everything else, a whole series of vulnerabilities found just like every other product. Um, so whatever you use, you have to keep patching it and getting to the latest version or you'll end up getting attacked by mass attacks as people write bots to attack the known vulnerabilities. VBScript was Microsoft's attempt to get in this game by writing their own based on Visual Basic, um, executed by the browser, and I think it can also be run on the server. And here again, you just have a script tag. Uh, JavaScript starts with a script. The default is JavaScript, but you can put a different type here and you give it type text VB script, and then it knows the stuff in here should be written in Visual Basic script, which would work in Internet Explorer, but not in an open source browser, because the open source community never found any reason to embrace VB script enough to bother writing processors for it, uh, as far as I know, that probably somebody did somewhere, but not in common use, because open source people would just use JavaScript. And this was Microsoft's attempt to muscle in and try to take some of JavaScript's market share, and they pretty much failed. JavaScript is pretty much established as the standard, and Microsoft never made it past the runner-up status, sort of like their attempt to take over the cell phone market. They have made many versions of Microsoft phones, and nobody cares. Everybody uses Android or Apple. And of course, like everything else, it has its vulnerabilities too, drifting by one thing or another. Um, and you can miss, you, unless you read local files, which is the directory traversal vulnerability that has afflicted Microsoft servers from the early days, where your web server actually serves up local files like the password file and configuration files and things that were really not intended to be part of the web page. As a general practice, the military is quite right about an air gap. You should not put any file on a web server that you don't want the whole world to see. This doesn't seem like rocket science, but it keeps happening over and over and over. The people put something on a web server and they say, oh no, someone found it. How did this happen? Anyway, um, so JavaScript is the very powerful language for simple scripting. It has branching, looping, and testing. You can do anything you want in it. For a while, this college used uh, online course delivery program called, I think, WebCT that was 100% written in JavaScript, I think. Anyway, you, by the way, if you ever have a large programming project, and it's all written in one language, the technical term for those developers is idiots. Because there are a reason why there's 100 languages. Each language is specialized for one purpose, and although you can do everything with one language, you can also do everything while standing on one foot in a hammock. It doesn't prove you're smart. And the smart companies use the specialized languages to do the portions of the job that they're designed for. But anyway, here's JavaScript that will pop up a box if you click on this button, something I found on the web. Um, anyway, and it has vulnerabilities too, of course, like every language. So I've got demonstrations of these, which we'll go back to a little later. Um, but I think now I've got a few eye clickers. Grab one if you need one. All right, let me write a piece of paper here. This is CNIT 123. server running. By the way, we just got our first uh, shipment of new equipment for the hacking lab and we got some software defined radios. So some of the students are starting a few projects there. They want to, uh, one obvious projects one thing I want to do is look at the encryption in power line adapters by looking at the radio emitted by the wire. Another thing is uh, reverse engineer these eye clickers. And another one they want to do is set up a fake cell phone tower so you can intercept phone calls. Those will be fun. We'll see how far that goes. The cell phone one we'll have to be careful to do in this room, which is a Faraday cage, so we don't catch any real phone traffic and run afoul of wiretapping laws. But anyway, uh, the gang is setting up those radios, so we may have some fun results coming out of that after they figure out how to make those things work. Anyway, um, so what's the most popular web server? Quit at 30. All right. 
It's Apache. By the way, the name is uh, because it's just a bunch of patches. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That may not be true anymore. Pardon me. I'm glad you're raising your hand. That used to be Apache, and I think it's no longer true. I think Microsoft won. Yep, just recently. I uh, thank you. I, I, Apache was the king for years, but I think uh, Microsoft just exceeded them. That's one of those questions where the right answer changes with time. Anyway, um, all right. So what language uses this percent sign like that? SP. It's not PHP. By the way, a si similar to that Microsoft winning, something I read yesterday is now the total monetary value of the annual income of the Google Play Store just exceeded the Apple App Store. That's another one of those big inversions. I think the average developer income is larger on iOS, but the total amount of value of the store is now bigger in Android because Android has so much of the market share. Like 85% of the phones are Android and all the rest are iOS and Microsoft is down below a percent like everybody else. All right, what's the client side scripting language that runs in IE but not in Chrome? I should probably take this slide out of here because I think this is pretty much out of date. It is very frustrating for developers and everyone else involved how the web keeps changing so fast that everything you made becomes out of date in two or three years and after a while they quit even supporting the language you wrote it in and people feel very abused to put many hours into developing beautiful things that don't work anymore. My sister especially, she teaches physiology to nurses and she has these beautiful models of hearts and circulatory systems and they all use technologies that have been abandoned years ago so they're having to boot up old operating system and old browsers to use them and it would be super expensive to make them again. They're using something called HyperCard that Apple used to make years ago and abandoned. It's, there's a market value there. If you find ways to help people continue using their old intellectual property that's in old languages, this is a gigantic problem across the whole business. Um, that people write things that are working fine and then the versions of everything move on to where the old stuff is suddenly not good enough and yet they still need it. Anyway, that's VBScript, another language that's on the way out. Duke that. All right. And uh, okay, so what's the server side language proprietary and developed by Microsoft? And this one's still used. I'm not sure what my sister's nursing school did, but what I told her was to get Windows XP machines, put them in virtual machines, and disconnect them from the internet, and let people look at your old stuff on those. I don't know if that's what she did, but that's one way to work around this huge problem, that, that the technology you need is no longer supported by anybody. Anyway, that's his uh, ASP, Active Server Pages. All right, so what language makes forms like that, where you can log in? Of course, I'm referring to just the part you can see there. I'll quit at 30. All right, and that is HTML that makes that form. But when you hit submit, it then goes up to the server and is processed by any of a variety of languages on the server side. All right, let me check my time. Good, all right. So, um, here's how things look on a modern server, and this is, there's some subtleties worth understanding here. So, the person is down here using a browser, typing in data, hitting submit. That goes up to the web server. You have web servers that hand it up, the handed 
served up the page over HTTP or HTTPS and received the reply, then they have to send it over to a database server. Now, there used to be a product called Microsoft Small Business Server. I don't know if they're still doing this, where you run everything on one server, the domain controller, the database, the website. This is a poor practice from the standpoint of security. It's only something you'd do if you're desperately poor. What you're supposed to do is have a separate machine over here with the database, because the database contains a whole lot of confidential data, like your passwords, credit card numbers, home addresses, things you don't want people stealing. And yet your web server is a constant focus of attack because it's obviously connected directly to everybody on the web. So what you do is you have this in your demilitarized zone, a semi-trusted network, where, and you don't have any real data stored on the web server, just the public facing data. To get over here, you now pass through another firewall, another level of security. So anybody on the web is not allowed to connect directly to your database server. All they can do is connect to the web server and then ask the web server to please ask a question of the database server and this is filtered. That's the kind of traffic control that is simple in companies, and this is why when you take over company networks, you have to pivot. First, you'll take over something you can see, like the web server, and put malware on here, and then you pivot, use this as the source of attack to attack other servers, because you can't attack them directly. Anyway, the technology to move data back and forth, you now have to have some kind of technology that will format data, like names and passwords, and send them over the wire, so you can ask questions of the database server, like, is this a valid name and password pair? If so, let me know. And that's using these connectivity tools, like ODBC, to move the data over. And then you have a server soft, a database software here, like SQL Server, or MySQL, or Oracle, or something, that is holding the valid credentials and able to answer questions about the database, like, is this a good password or not? So that's the game. ODBC is the old, uh, old-fashioned version of this software that moves things together, and there are other versions, and they're just ways of formatting data to move it over network. Um, ODBC is an old uh, standard one, and it lets you move from a, into a wide variety of database management systems, uh, and it's interoperable among them all, which is its main virtue. Um, it's just a standardized way to organize data to move it over network and then process it with uh, uh, processing services on the other end. Mike, there are a few ones that came later, like Olay and Microsoft's ActiveX data object that are just attempts to upgrade and improve those. Uh, but they all serve essentially the same purpose, and details are not that important to us. Um, so, you can use many different platforms and programming languages, and the application security is very important. So, if people can control your web server itself, they can deface the website, steal the company data, take over user accounts, uh, use your machine as the uh, source of attacks on other people, and so on. OWASP is the organization that analyzes these vulnerabilities. It's an open source uh, volunteer organization. Almost everybody in the game is in OWASP. Uh, the students and I staffed the OWASP booth at the RSA convention a few years back, and we were supposed to get new members, but there were no new members. Everybody came to the table to say how much they love OWASP, and they're already a member. All the companies send people to it, Microsoft and Apache, or Microsoft and all the open source groups, and everybody is in it. It's great. They publish a lot of papers, a lot of source code for products you can run, and they have the top 10 web application vulnerabilities. And these, I think, are not exactly in order, they certainly aren't, but these are the top 10 vulnerabilities. Um, command injection has always been the number one. Um, SQL injection is the most commonly abused form, but there are other forms um, where you can inject other uh, Strings, but you've been doing it in the lab. SQL injection is the most dangerous vulnerability in all of security. Used to store, steal more than 90% of all stolen data ever, where you can just take a page that's taking in something like a name and password and put in carefully crafted malicious names and passwords and steal all the data from a vulnerable server. Uh, cross-site scripting is a much less serious vulnerability. Most people I, that um, have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities don't pay anything when you hear about them, and when you tell them, they don't even bother to fix them. They just don't care, usually. So it's estimated that 11% of the websites on the web have SQL injection vulnerability, which is really serious, and 80% of them have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, which people do not take as seriously because a cross-site scripting vulnerability does not give me the ability to hack into the web server. All it means is I have something like a comment page, and I can put up comments which will have scripts which run in other people's browsers. And that allows one user to attack another user, but it does not allow any of us to steal data directly from the company server, so they don't take it as seriously. So let's, um, the, looking for my cross-site scripting demonstrations, there they are, all right. So the cross-site scripting demos are here, and here's reflected cross-site scripting. So you have a reason for an error, like developer was drunk. 
you submit it and you say, here's the error, developer was drunk. So you have a page that tells you what the problem is. The problem is you can put in scripting tags in there. And this is one of the classic ones you do. So you put in HTML script tags, and now this page, giving me some kind of error, probably via Chrome detected unusual code on the page. And see, this is because Chrome is protecting you from this. And this is only the Chrome browser, although Firefox is doing more of it. A lot of browsers are now blocking cross-site scripting all by themselves. They notice, if, see, and what they did was the browser looked at the URL it's serving up, and the URL is some kind of domain, then a message, and in the message up here, it's got script alert. And the browser has decided, I don't want to serve up pages that have HTML right up there in the bar. That looks fishy. So if you want to see this stuff, you've got to use a browser that doesn't protect you as much. I think Firefox will let it through. Um, and that's another reason why it's kind of all right that um, companies don't take this too seriously because other defenses are gradually appearing to protect you from this. But anyway, it is certainly the case that people don't take this very, very seriously. I need advanced network settings, no proxy. Okay. Now let's go to that page and see it in all of its glory. I said go there. All right. And now the uh, cross-site scripting demonstrations here. If I put that junk in there, then it runs as expected. It pops up a box. This is what's typically done is to pop up a box just to demonstrate the vulnerability. And what that means is I could have used more malicious scripts that redirect the page, send it elsewhere, um, take data from this page, and send it to a third server to steal your name and password, and so on. Um, so here's some more examples. Uh, this one here is just the on click. It will demonstrate that it pops up. This one will demonstrate the document cookie, which means now you can steal my session cookie. Whenever you log into a server, you now have a cookie, which is a supposedly long random number, which identifies who you are. And unless these people have integrated anti-CSRF tokens into their system, you can steal that cookie, put it on another machine, and be in their account. This works for almost all modern services. Um, so this is what you do. I can take your cookie value and pop it up in a box, and I can just as well send it off to a third uh, party site. Other things I can do is I can open a pop-up window that contains content from a different server. So now I popped up content from some other server on your page. And this is one of the most common defacements is um, to open up an iframe which has content from a third page and shrink it to size zero so I add malware to your page. So now people look at your page that might be just a Facebook or a forum and it's including scripts from some other site and people are getting affected and attacked by that script. And here's the one that actually sends the cookie to a remote log. Um, but it looks like it's not working here. Anyway, I'm not going to worry about that one. So the, uh, there's a few examples of things you can do with cross-site scripting. And I have a couple others. I go back to this one, uh, the insecure forum. The, uh, where's, here's the old one, the vulnerable message board. This one's fun. Here's the one that redirects your page. So I can put in my name. So I put in my name here, and I put in a normal name. I end up here being Sam. And if I erase the old comments, if I put in a comment of hi, it just puts it, whoo, should put it on the page. Oh, yeah, excuse me. Since I switched to HTTPS, it broke some of my scripts. I need to use the insecure version. All right. And now I'll go here, hi. And still doesn't work right. Well, I think I've shown you that one before. I think I'm going to quit struggling with it for the moment. Um, we'll carry on here. All right. That's what the problem is. I've upgraded my security on my site. Uh, some of the old stuff quits barking. Anyway, uh, so malicious file execution allows users to upload and execute malicious files. Uh, you ready? You get to upload files. This one of this is why uh, one of the award-winning hacks at DEF CON a few years ago was the GIFR attack. You can make a file. Uh, GIFs have only a file header but no footer. And JARs, Java archives that are executable code, have only a file footer but not a file header. Or else I've got them backwards. So you can make one file 
with an appropriate header and an appropriate footer that is both a GIF image and a JAR archive. And it's perfectly valid to both processors. So if you have a website that lets you put up a GIF image, like your profile, you can upload a file that's an image file, and then you can execute it as executable code. And that fool, this is, this is fairly common, that anybody that lets you upload any innocent file can be tricked into uploading a malicious file, and then you're running code on somebody else's server. So that's one there. Unsecured direct object reference is a very common um, vulnerability in home routers. Uh, a lot of, the right way to do authentication is a lot of work. You have to have some kind of name and password. People have to log in. When they log in, you have to give them some kind of session token. Then every future request has to look at the session token, figure out who they are and whether they are allowed to do this or that. And it has to authenticate them with an account on the system so that you can have file permissions saying that people that are logged in as a normal user can only go to this folder, but only the administrator can go in that folder. A lot of people just can't be bothered with all that, so they just take the confidential stuff and put it on a page and then don't have a link directly to it. They have a login page on the way to get to it. So if you log into your router and get to the administration page, you're now at admin.html. And if you just don't log in and go directly to admin.html, you can administer the router because it doesn't really know who you are and apply permissions based on who you are. It just uses security through obscurity. They don't make it easy for you to find the page unless you go through the part where you have to log in. That's called unsecured direct object reference. And it's very common, and it's also the heart of directory traversal vulnerabilities and the ones I mentioned before where someone puts a file on a web server, but they hope no one will find it. If you were going to do that, you should have put some kind of file permission on the server so you know that unauthorized people can't get into it, but people often don't bother. And um, so eventually someone finds it, usually Google, because Google has greatly perfected the art of scanning every server and finding every file on it, whether you've linked to it or not, that is their business. So you put some file on a web server, you think nobody's going to find it, and next week people are finding it with a Google search. Anyway, cross-site request forgery is where you trick a um, request into taking effect at another site. One kind is I can put a link on my page, or even worse, an image tag on my page, which causes your browser to go to another site and do something. You did this in the uh, um, a Security Shepherd project. There's a cross-site request forgery there where um, a image tag causes the administrator, when they read the email, to go to another page and, and elevate you to administrator. And you can make people go to another page and buy your book on Amazon or post something on Facebook because they look at your web page and it contains a tag that causes them to go execute something in another domain. A similar version of it is to steal a cookie and reuse the cookie on another machine. So again, um, some script is being run in an unexpected environment. Some, some uh, in that case, it's just a cookie, but you can also do a script. Anyway, then there's information leakage and error handling. A lot of websites have error messages that tell you too much. If you install web servers and other products, by default, they typically put a banner at the header of every response that tells you exactly what version of everything you're running, which is unnecessary. It helps attackers. A lot of pages, like the ones you just saw, my page had an error and all these messages, error messages go all over the screen. That's because I deliberately set up that server in a non-recommended way to expose all errors. And a lot of them are that way, so that you can actually see like a page of source code. Uh, the Republican National Party site was that way. I went poking around it around 2008 or 2009, and I uh, just typed, I wanted a very SQL injection vulnerable, I just put an apostrophe in the URL, and I got a page of ASP source code. And I said, you know, I think I better quit messing around here. Uh, I was beginning to get a clue that that is illegal, which unfortunately it is. I didn't know it was illegal at that time, but it is illegal to um, detect vulnerabilities in someone else's site without permission. I thought if you didn't do any harm, it would be legal, but it's not that way. It's technically illegal just to discover that they have vulnerabilities. Anyway, um, so that I mentioned broke, yeah? Did they fix it? Uh, yes, when I went back a few years later, they seemed like they got a more professional company and it was all a whole lot cleaner, yeah. So that was around 2008 when Obama ran in a primary against Hillary and uh, the web, the whole idea of having a significant web presence of a candidate was new at that time. They highly credited Obama for bringing this along. It was his fantastic ability to use instant messaging and websites to actually gather his followers that moved him along. And it was, until then, politics was pretty much done with like no, people knocking door to door, the telephone and pieces of paper that you handed out. And the idea of actually using the internet to organize it was considered new. Anyway, um, like I mentioned, broken authentication and session management 
it's quite common where people don't really have a good system that has you log in so they really know who you are and they really keep track of who you are and assign positions based on that. They have some other lame system where um, it looks like you're logging in, but you haven't. I should mention a similar thing happened with the first generation of encrypted USB sticks. That was about nine years ago. Uh, people became aware of the fact they did a survey like six years ago and they asked top company executives, how many of those USB sticks do you own? And the answer was 15, and how many have you lost? And the answer is 10. So they're all full of company data. Everybody has them, they lose them, they forget them behind everywhere. So all that company data is just floating around. And they said, well, you know, that stuff should be encrypted. So there became pressure to buy encrypted USB sticks, and the first generation of them were not encrypted. They just had a login page. So if you plug it into a Windows machine, it will pop up a login page and demand to see your password before you can see the contents of the stick. So they looked encrypted, but if you just plug them in a Linux machine and use DD to copy the data, the data is all in plain text. So uh, this is where you get an interesting argument, which will come up over and over again in security. The developers could say, I accomplished the goal. If you drop the stick and someone picks it up and plugs it in a Windows machine, they won't get the data. They say, you didn't, the other people will say you didn't accomplish the goal because it's not really encrypted and another person can get it. They say, yeah, but I stopped a certain attack. The most common attack has been stopped. Now there's a more exotic attack that will get through and that's all that ever happens. But anyway, um, if you want a really encrypted USB stick, Iron Key is a good company. They had ones that you are like strong and you can drive over with a truck and they cost more. And when they said they were encrypted, they were really encrypted. Anyway, um, that's another example here, unsecured cryptographic storage where you use weak keys or knowing or old uh, techniques of encryption and so on. We implement cryptography badly. This is extremely common. Even people that implement cryptography tend to do it wrong and leak out secrets. And that's why I was motivated to actually have a cryptography class we'll have next semester to understand, to go through this in more detail because it is very difficult to hire people at your company that actually understand encryption well enough to do it right. And if you just take your average server administrator or web administrator and tell them encrypt this stuff by next week, they will install some library and turn it on, but they don't know what they're doing and the results won't be as good as you think they should be. Anyway, uh, then unsecured communication where you just don't bother to encrypt things at all, like passwords, failure to restrict URL access, like say another example where there are magic URLs that give you privileges you shouldn't have and you just hope people won't find them instead of actually having an authentication and permission structure to just block them out of there. And so there's cross-site scripting I was talking about. Let me see how my time is doing. So I thought we're getting about to the right time to take a break here. Yeah, let's take a break and we'll pick up after this. Give, we'll pick up 10 minutes after 10. Let me see if I can get some version of my demos working. That's more fun than talking about this stuff. I'll stop the recording. We'll pick up 10 after 10. This is 1.23. 10A, I think.